Okay, the next step in our emergency medical response course, again, focusing on things that Mrs. Smith needs us to do. Needs us to find and fix things that are going to harm her. So this lesson, we're going to focus on a couple of major big things, hypoxia and shock, that cause Mrs. Smith problems. And we're going to work with uh, the paramedic unit to help her with those, explain stuff to her along the way, help her get through this bad day. But we need to do some things to help her um, deal with some of the stuff that happens and shock and hypoxia are the two major things um, that we're going to focus on here. We're going to deal with injuries in another lesson. We'll talk about birthing some new Smiths down the road and talk about uh, working the code right off the bat. Our plan, get there promptly and safely, approach and enter efficiently and safely, be nice, be good. This is part of being good. Know what you're doing and be safe and then always help that medic crew. Here's the assessment and treatment five-step plan again. I hope this is still on your arm, hasn't been washed off. You should never forget this. And we're going to work on it until it becomes second nature. And then you can take a bath and wash this off your arm. The first step, is this a code? If the patient's not breathing and not doesn't have a pulse, we're going to have to work this full arrest. However, most of our patients do have a pulse and are breathing. And so we need to talk about that and figure out what to do to assess their circulation, their ventilation, and their oxygenation. We're going to find and fix big things that are wrong with them, or at least things that we can fix, record some vitals, record some history. But really, we're talking about the second step, the CVO, the circulate, ventilate, and oxygenate. But we got to do some definitions first. Hypoxia and shock, these are two things that cause Mrs. Smith some harm, but what are they? Very simply, hypoxia is low levels of oxygen, low levels of oxygen in the cells. What is shock? It's low blood flow to the cells. Shock, of course, would cause hypoxia because shock would be a case where we're not having enough circulation to bring oxygen to the cells, but there's more to it. And so we want to deal with hypoxia and shock, and we want you to know signs of them and treatments for them and know that inside and out. <clears throat> but the first big question is, why do we breathe? And so you're like, oh, no, duh, what a, what a stupid question. But really, think about it. Why do we need to breathe? Well, we need to breathe to bring in oxygen. Okay, duh, so why? Why do we need oxygen? Uh, because uh, the cells need oxygen. Yes, yes, yes. But why do the cells need oxygen? Well, the cells use oxygen to make energy so that cells can do whatever it is that they do. If it's a heart cell, it does conduction or it does pacing or it does contraction and pumping of blood. If it's a brain cell, it, it does whatever it's supposed to do in that part of the brain. If it's a lung cell or a, or a finger cell or a, or a toe cell, they all need oxygen to make energy so they can do cell business. So we breathe in order to bring in oxygen. The lack of oxygen would be hypoxia. Hypoxia uh, causes a situation where cells don't have energy to do what they're supposed to do, and we die. Now, what could cause hypoxia? Well, it could be a kind of a weird case where there's just not enough oxygen in the environment. Everything's working fine with the body, <clears throat> but the body's in a bad place. Extremely high altitude, confined space, um, there's low oxygen in the environment. So just to be complete, that one's in there. But that one hardly ever applies to us in, in Mrs. Smith's calls for the fire district. It could be that you're having trouble getting oxygen to the alveoli. So, uh-oh, here's an anatomical term. An alveolus is one of the microscopic tiny air sacs um, in the lungs. And the magic happens there. That's where the oxygen gets into the bloodstream. The air that we breathe in mixes with the bloodstream. And so if there's a problem getting oxygen to the alveoli, then we end up with hypoxia. It could be that everything's working fine, the respiratory system. The air's coming in. We're getting plenty of oxygen. There's plenty of oxygen in the air. It's getting in the alveoli. It's mixing with the blood, but there's poor circulation. And so there's no oxygen being delivered, even though <clears throat> there's plenty of oxygen coming in. So there's three causes for you, and uh, we'll ask you about those several hundred times. So hypoxia signs and symptoms. Here's another list of five things. And this is a big deal. And so if you've got the assessment five steps written on one arm, then you probably ought to try to write these somewhere else. 
um, on a different arm. So <clears throat> hypoxia, signs and symptoms, five big deals. They have an altered mental status. That happens very early. Your brain needs a continuous supply of oxygen. It can't store any oxygen, so you have to continuously supply it. If you don't have enough oxygen, your brain is the first um, place where you're going to see some symptoms, some signs. The patient will be anxious. They'll be scared. They'll be maybe lightheaded or confused or unconscious or sleepy or lots of various things. And so this may be a shock to you, but a lot of our patients have altered mental status, and it's not from hypoxia, but that's one of the big causes of altered mental status. They may be breathing rapidly. So if you're having trouble getting oxygen to the cells, your body will naturally have you breathe faster to try to get more oxygen in. You may have a fast heart rate. If you're having trouble getting oxygen to the cells, your body will cause <clears throat> your heart to pump what you do have around even faster. So those two things kind of come together um, as a response to your body sensing that there's a drop in oxygen. It's going to try to breathe faster and, um, and have your heart pump faster. So those are really compensations. Those are compensatory mechanisms that show up there. We may be able to actually measure oxygen content in the blood with a pulse oximeter, a very simple device that clips onto a finger and magically looks through the skin and measures the amount of oxygen saturation um, that is in the blood at the finger. If we could measure it at the brain or in the, in the heart, that would be better, but we can't do that, so we have to substitute this pulse oximeter as a way to measure. But it is an objective um, way to take a measurement and see how hypoxic the patient is as long as the measurement is accurate. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that a lot more. It also could be that there's a skin change. Now, um, you'll see us compare this with shock symptoms down the road. There's some skin changes there. But the skin change that we really talk about with hypoxia now is cyanosis. Cyanosis means blue lips, uh, blue nail beds, blue face. Cyanosis is very late and it's a very bad sign. Your patient is hypoxic long before they become cyanotic. So cyanosis shows up well after hypoxia has been present for a while. So if you're only just waiting for cyanosis to detect hypoxia, you're going to miss a bunch of it. You're going to be very late in the game. But there's five good signs of hypoxia and you really ought to know those. Hey, and there's five treatments for hypoxia because almost everything we do comes in fives. Hypoxia treatment. If they're low on oxygen, how about we give them some oxygen? And it may be that we need to also ventilate them. You know, we can provide oxygen to their face. We can give them lots of oxygen in their nose or in their mouth and nose, but really the oxygen doesn't matter there. It matters when it gets to the alveoli in the lungs. And if you think about the respiratory system as an upside down tree, the pulmonary tree, we have the trunk as the trachea, and then it branches and branches and branches, and then the leaves on the tree are the alveoli. That's what matters. The O2 level at the leaves of the tree makes a difference. We can get lots of oxygen in the trachea by just providing supplemental. Sometimes we have to ventilate as well. We have to force it in. We can also position the patient. A lot of patients who are hypoxic may just need us to set them up a little or, or maybe to turn them um, in a position to where they're not uh, suffocating themselves essentially. So positioning fits in there as well. We need to manage the airway. If the airway is not open, if the tongue is obstructing and we are not getting any air into the trachea, we need to manage that. So jaw thrust, <clears throat> positioning, manage the airway. And then the other one is transport. So what you're going to see is five signs of hypoxia, five treatments for hypoxia, and we're also going to have those very same thing for shock. Now we talked about three causes for hypoxia. Let's talk about three causes for shock. Shock is inadequate circulation, inadequate tissue perfusion. We're not circulating blood all the way out to the tissues. So let's talk about the cardiovascular system. There's three main components. There's the heart, which is the pump. Got a problem with the pump, you're going to have shock. Another major component is the blood volume, the fluid volume. 
if you think of this as a system with a pump and some fluid that it circulates through some pipes, then you have the three main components of the cardiovascular system. If the pump's not working, we have shock. If we've lost too much fluid volume, we have shock. If there's something wrong with the pipes, the vascular container, they are, are too large or they're leaking or they become too small, they're supposed to be a certain size. And so we may have a vascular container problem. So there's three causes for shock would be pump problem, volume problem, container problem. <clears throat> Signs of, of shock, interestingly, looks pretty much like hypoxia, doesn't it? At the start, at least. Altered mental status, fast breathing, fast heart rate. Shock and hypoxia look the same. The skin changes for shock, but the patient's skin will become cool. It will become pale. It will become moist. It becomes cool because there's not warm blood going by. There's poor circulation. Warm blood's not going past the skin where you're feeling. It becomes pale because there's not red blood going by. And the skin becomes a pale color instead of the nice pink color that you would expect. And your skin gets moist uh, as part of this response. And nobody really understands why. It doesn't matter. It just is. So cool, pale, moist, cool, pale, clammy skin goes along with fast breathing, fast heart rate <clears throat> is one of the big signs of shock. And then a very late and very bad sign is when we actually measure the blood pressure <clears throat> or estimate the blood pressure and we find that the blood pressure is low. Now how would you measure a blood pressure? Well, blood pressure cuff, stethoscope. We'll talk about that a lot more. Get practice until um, you're very, very good at it. It could also be that that takes too long and we can just estimate that the patient has low blood pressure by finding that they don't have a radial pulse. They don't have a peripheral pulse. They have a central pulse. They still have a carotid pulse in the neck or a femoral pulse at the groin. Uh, a good central pulse is still there, but they don't have a peripheral pulse. Their pressure has lowered and they don't have a peripheral pulse. So anyway, five signs of shock. Altermental status, which can be kind of hard to pinpoint. Is this guy in shock or is he intoxicated or both? And then you see rapid breathing, rapid heart rate, cool pale, clammy skin, and eventually a low blood pressure. If you wait to assess shock by a drop in blood pressure, your patient will have been in shock for a long time before their pressure ever dropped. There's five treatments for shock. And these are quick and simple. You provide oxygen. You keep them warm. You position them supine, flat. You control any blood loss that you can, and you transport. So you'll get really good at this. You'll be able to say the five signs of shock, alter mental status, uh, tachycardia, tachypnea, cool, pale, clammy skin, low blood pressure. You'll learn to start substituting those medical terms, tachycardia, fast heart rate, tachypnea, fast breathing rate, and you'll be able to say these. By the time that you're done with the EMT class, um, we can walk up to you at any point, find you in Walmart and say five signs of shock, and you will say alter mental status, tachycardia, tachypnea, cool pill, clammy skin, and hypotension. And we will clap and scream and make a big scene in the middle of Walmart. So check this out. Shock versus hypoxia. Here they are side by side. Altered mental status. It's the first sign, but it's the most subtle and it can also be confusing because it can occur with lots of other stuff like, you know, drunk people. And then breathing rate is fast, heart rate is fast. So up to this point, we know there's a problem. And then the shock patients will get cool, pale, and clammy. The hypoxic patients will get cyanotic very late. And then we can actually measure it with a blood pressure cuff on the shock side and a pulse oximeter for an O2 saturation, an O2 sat. It's not an O2 stat. People that say that sound stupid, so don't be one of those people. It's not a stat. It's a sat. It's saturation. Just saying. I had to go on a rant for just a second. What are the things that you must be able to do? Mrs. Smith must trust that you can do these things following this lesson. You have to be able to find pulses and assess breathing. You have to be able to open airways and give ventilations. You have to be able to provide oxygen when it's needed. You need to be able to manage external bleeding, deal with some injuries and wounds, we'll talk about that, and you need to be able to do CPR and use the AED. That's what she needs you to do. Five big things she needs you to be able to do, and we're here to help you learn how to do that.